Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Brian Baptist Church for this, our Sunday night service. I'm so glad you're here. And not only this, this is the miracle service. And it is because it is the post-Berean brunch service. And so the miracle that takes place is people actually awaking and reviving from their food comas. Though I don't know, I was uh, in the choir, I'm not sure some of those folks completely revived. But uh, nevertheless, glad to have you here tonight. It's going to be a wonderful evening. Uh, good to have Miss Deidre Brown here, and she's going to be talking more about her medical ministry. I heard the children had a wonderful time in junior church, and I saw the extra snacks that you gave my wife. I'm going to hit her up for some of those a little bit later. And so, anyway, just wonderful. We're going to start by singing. Uh, Brother Mark here is going to lead us in a, in a song here. Go ahead. All right, turn your songbooks to page number 341, 341, Victory in Jesus. Go ahead and stand with me if you would, please. We'll sing with our hearts to the Lord, amen. I heard an old, old story, how the Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming. Love me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again. And caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and won to be the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me. And bought me with his redeeming blood. Praise God. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. Wonderful singing. I always like the competition here. I'm looking at the competition uh, between Southside Baptist Church and Northside Baptist Church. Uh, I had some people, they deliberately had their attenders, and they moved from Southside Baptist Church to Northside Baptist Church today. Uh, I don't know what you folks are doing over here. But uh, anyway, and uh, so anyway, but it's good because that, what is that makes you, you guys are the recruitment arm of the church right here. And uh, anyway, glad to have each and every one of you here tonight. What a wonderful meal that we had uh, after service. The whole day was a blessing. 
and, uh, and um, you folks try so hard. You try to eat every ounce of food that exists during that meal, and you just never quite do it. I, I still just have the goal in sight, but you just don't quite get there. Uh, but that is good. Mrs. Watkins and I were plenty happy. We went home with zero leftovers, so we know uh, that you worked very, very hard on that. And, um, and Mrs. Watkins, you, you did get a thumbs up for the uh, international dinner uh, for the shrimp and the snow peas. You got a thumbs up for that. She still hasn't made that for me yet. Uh, she has some extra oyster sauce left over. And uh, anyway, <laughs> she looks at that. There. Yeah, don't ask her opinion on oyster sauce. But uh, anyway, um, uh, gl glad that you're here. Glad that uh, for missions, uh, some more of you turned in your cars, cards today, committing uh, throughout the year to give to missions. Thank you so much. There may still be a few stragglers out there. Uh, but uh, anyway, feel free to continue to work uh, to get those in. But we look forward to just an amazing, amazing uh, missions year. Um, I don't know when the need has been greater. There are so many things uh, going on around our world. And um, I heard from um, uh, Paul Van Hray's wife and just um, some of the heartache that takes place in some of these countries that are war-torn. And of course, uh, me and Mark, Caleb, and I went there a few years ago, and then uh, begin, um, it was about a year ago this time that uh, the military took over the country, uh, deposed their nation's leader, imprisoned her, and it's been in a state of civil war now. And, um, and um, you know, with heartbreak, uh, uh, she was telling me, a pastor's wife, uh, that my wife and I ministered to at a pastor's wives retreat late uh, late 2018, and she passed away due to complications of childbirth, uh, leaves behind her pastor husband and six children. And, and part of the difficulty is the complete uh, breakdown of the, of the medical system in that country due to the war. And then there was a, another young person who went to um, discipleship boot camp either this year or last year and was, was killed uh, when the, uh, the Burmese military uh, bombed civilians' home in Kaya, Kaya State. And so just a lot of difficulties and a lot of heartache going on. And I thank you for our missionary in Ukraine who uh, right now they're taking in refugees at the church they're in. And so the, the, needs are, the needs are great. And so among uh, this backdrop that, uh, that Miss Deidre is in the middle of this. And so anyway, certainly be in prayer for her. Let's ask God's blessing on the service tonight. And uh, let God stir our hearts uh, regarding what is going on in our world and particularly for the case of the gospel. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, loving us so much that you sent us a savior the savior and that is uh, uh, all the fullness of the godhead in bodily form that you sent us uh, literally um, literally you in the flesh uh, the second person of the godhead our lord and savior jesus christ we thank you for the sacrifice of his blood for our sins so that we could be your adopted children and destined for heaven. And Lord, even though we greatly long for heaven, we know that you have left us on this earth for a divine purpose. And I pray that that purpose would be realized. And I pray even tonight that you would be a help to us in, in our spirits uh, to know your will, uh, to know the next step, to know how uh, we can be effective servants of yours. We pray you would stir us yet again in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you're seated, uh, Mark's going to lead you in another song here. <clears throat> All right. Turn to page number 188. 188. Happiness is the Lord. Some of you kids know this from Sunday school class. So let's go ahead and sing this one here. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. 
Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me in close relation, having a part in his salvation. Happiness is the Lord, real joy is mine, no matter if the teardrops start, I have a secret, it's Jesus in my heart. Happiness is to be forgiven, living a life that's worth the living, taking a trip that leads to heaven. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is the Lord. Amen. Very good. Always love it when a bass hits a high note. That's always a good thing. And always uh, watching to see if uh, the vocal cords remain within the throat cavity. And it's a wonderful thing. Glad to have each and every one of you here. Um, again, in a few minutes here, Miss Deidre Brown, medical missionary, she is going to uh, give you a report. And uh, she's one of those organized ones. And she has pictures and she has videos. And she knows how to do PowerPoint. I don't know how to do PowerPoint. All I know how to do is create zany vacation Bible school videos. That's all I know what to do. But, uh, but anyway, she's very good at that and looking forward uh, to that report. And the children uh, had a wonderful report and asked uh, very interesting questions like, uh, you know, little children in a foreign country on a nap mat. And uh, important question, why don't they have blankets? Okay, and, uh, and you know, what did you learn? I learned that children in a foreign country and nap mats don't have any blankets. So, you know, the different things that people learn. And uh, anyway, but had a wonderful time down there and I'm grateful for that. Let me make mention of a few things here. We have a few of these, just a small number of these. Uh, these are, this is a devotional called Dwell, and it's a 30-day devotional. Uh, this is for the month of April, which is coming up rather quickly. There is a few in the turnstile out there in the foyer, so I want to draw your attention to that in case you want one of those mm -hmm. and while they last. And then <clears throat> another, um, as my wife and I go to these different conferences, sometimes we see a, a booklet we go, we'd like to add that uh, to the different booklets we have. We have booklets on motherhood and, and fatherhood and other different uh, critical issues. Uh, as I point your attention, we have a booklet on missions. What is the uh, the church and missions. What is the church responsibility, the believer's responsibility? That this one caught my eye, and we got some of these and brought these. And again, this one's called The Tragedy of Bitterness. And, um, and uh, people go through a different, different things in life, and, and some of the things are, are, are difficult. Uh, some of the things are, and, and reasonably and rightly so, it's unfair. You know, that is why Jesus said, he said, Pray for those who, uh, who persecute you. And then he uses this term, and despitefully use you. Well, that doesn't sound fair. And it isn't fair. And sometimes it's hard to get through those unfair things. And this book may be a help to somebody. Uh, by the way, I've uh, preached a message called The Unfair God. Uh, God is patently unfair. I just wanted you to know that. He unfairly sent his only begotten, perfect, innocent son to die for the sins of somebody else when his son had done nothing wrong. That's unfair. But you're happy now that God is unfair because that's called God's mercy and that's how we have salvation in the first place. But that is a book that is there. And then this here, uh, right at the end of service, I'm going to have a very, very short uh, meeting for those that are interested in care center ministry. And uh, what I'll do is I'm going to have the meeting right over here, right after service. I won't take a lot of your time I have a sign-up list, but one of the reasons is, is because now that things are moving beyond COVID, I know you're almost afraid to say that, aren't you? But uh, anyway, moving beyond COVID, um, um, certain political parties are now crying tears because they didn't want it to end. And, uh, but anyway, what this means is some of the care facilities are opening up. Uh, there are certain guidelines and restrictions we need to adhere to, but uh, Subtle Care is opening up this Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. And uh, then we're also looking at Mackay Creek, Lord willing, Thursday, 
that's Subtle Care Tuesday, Mackay Creek Thursday at 12.30 p.m., which means this ministry is expanding as a ministry of Brian Baptist Church, and that means um, uh, our needs are increasing with that too, and maybe you can help in meeting some of those needs. So I'll talk to you a little bit over here right at the end of service. And so then something else that takes place, and time to get you your wheels going on this, and that is right after service is over and this meeting's over, um, we are doing a sanctioned kidnapping of Miss Deidre Brown and her father, Buddy, uh, because we're taking them to a restaurant uh, because they are Baptists and they need to eat. And so, but we are taking them, but as you know, of course, uh, we feed them, but you can come on your own dime. And so we're looking at going up to Sherry's after service. Go, Pastor, why Sherry's? Because Sherry's has a very special food group. You know, the food pyramid, all these important healthy things. And in Sherry's food pyramid is something called pie. And, um, and then there's dairy in there too. They call that a la mode. And uh, so anyway, we're going up there. You may want to come and, and, you know, have a cup of coffee because coffee is good for you, so I say. And uh, by the way, chocolate is good for you too. Ask the late Paul Harvey. He said chocolate was good for you. And, um, but anyway, so we'll have a wonderful time of fellowship up there. And so in a little bit here, after uh, Miss Deidre uh, reports on her ministry, we'll try to get a head count on that so we can give them advance notice because we've discovered certain, um, how do I say this carefully, live stream. For some organization is a fact, for other is a theory. And, uh, and we don't always know what we're going to get, so we try to get the information out there as far in advance as we possibly can. Also, coming up, we have All Church Work Day is coming, and that is uh, at 8.30. You'll be greeted uh, by uh, coffee and donuts and everything else unhealthy we can think of. Uh, and that'll be 8.30 this Saturday, and then we go to work on this whole place, and there really is so much to do. And uh, there's, there's spring cleaning, and there's, and there's window washing, and pew washing, and cobweb removal, and uh, get the lawn and grounds done. And there's always some little project you think, pastor can't possibly think of enough projects. Oh, yes, I can. And uh, anyway, and so we'll just have it, and I usually stage the area, have everything laid out on the table so you don't have to go looking hither and yon across the entire church building indoors and outdoors to try to find the item that you need for your project. And so I encourage you to come by Wednesday night. I'll have a project list there that you can sign off on. And if for some reason you're not here Wednesday night to sign off on a project, that's okay. I'll volunteer you. It'll be all right. And uh, anyway, we'll have a wonderful, wonderful time and we get so much done. And so that is going to be taking place here on Saturday. And so what is going to happen is, uh, is uh, Mark and I, Mrs. Watkins, we're going to vacate the stage. And the reason we're going to vacate the stage is because uh, uh, Benjamin, who is my lighting technician over here, uh, uh, Sherry, you can vacate the stage too. Um, uh, just letting, I'm letting her go. And, uh, and Benjamin's going to catch, all we need to catch Benjamin is just these front lights right here. That's all we need to catch. And, um, and Miss Deidre, again, a medical missionary, you have to tell us how you got through COVID. That had to have been an adventure. And you, know, and you managed somehow to get set free before so many other people did. And so that's got to be a story in and of itself. But Deidre, we're going to have you start right now. And she's going to kind of take things on the floor. And I found that I do better with a timer. My dad would love to tell you the story about when I said, give me a five-minute warning, and I somehow missed that. And somehow he was doing this, and I still missed it. So we're st I'm going to work on having a timer. Um, let's see. So I'm excited to be back with you, and I think that um, most of you here this morning know that I am a pharmacist. And using the pharmacy skills that the Lord had given me on the mission field as a tool to share the gospel. So um, sometimes we use moon pies. Whatever we have in our hand, we are able to give. I had a, um, I was at my church giving a presentation told about being in Romania and seeing these little kids starving. They had the brassy 
orange hair, just the bloated stomach that they were hungry. We, gave, we were digging in our backpacks, pouring out goldfish in their hand, everything. And I told that missionary, I said, next time I come, I want to come to this place and I want to bring some food for these babies. And so I was thinking something more nutritious and I shared that at my church and one of the guys worked for a food service company and he said, can you use the moon pies? I can get you all the moon pies you need. So I'm kind of famous for my moon pies and they, the kids are excited that I have moon pies. Um, also several years ago, I all, every time I go, I ask the missionary that we work with, is there something I can bring for you? What would you like? All, most of the time they always say peanut butter because they can't get it or it's really expensive, whatever. You know, something that they want and like. And one lady said, my little girl needs some pajama pants. So I went to this store and I like a good bargain and found the onesie pajamas for 25 cents and I thought this isn't what she wanted but I can't leave these on the shelf that would just be wrong so I bought those took them a lady the mil, the missionary Melanie gave it to a lady in the church that had two kids that those fit perfectly the woman came to me crying speaking in Spanish say, thanking me that her babies would no longer be cold because they had holes in the floor so that began the finding these bargains, the clothes that I get for 95% off and are able to share in these places because as you know, taking medicine in, mostly it's third world countries where we can go in where it's a need, we also are able to take the clothes. So I love this with Patrice there, she has the pink and the blue. Um, I told the kids this morning, I said, it didn't really match and one of them said, it doesn't look bad together. <laughs> so. Um, but she was so excited that she had um, her clothes that uh, you can see he's modeling his new tennis shoes. But anyway, just a blessing to be able to share that. The Lord has supplied. One time I was at work, my mom, I still, let me just give you a little aside. When I moved back to Chattanooga, Tennessee to go back to get some Bible training, I worked at Walmart Pharmacy. That's where I accepted a job. I told them I will work for you when I'm home. This is not my career. Pharmacy, I mean, missions is my career. And so they have been good to me. That's how I get my insurance. And, but I just work sporadically when I'm home or when it's COVID and I work a lot. And the Lord worked all that out too. So anyway... I was at work one day, and my mom called, and I thought, oh, no, something's wrong. She never calls me at work. And I said, hello, and she said, yeah, I'm at Walmart, and they've got backpacks for a dollar a piece. How many do you want me to get? And I said, well, how many, how many do they have? She goes, oh, they've got more than I can afford. And I said, okay, just get how many you want. Just call me back and let me know. So long time afterwards, I think I finally called her, and I said, how many did you get? She goes, I bought all they had, and I so I thought you couldn't afford them. She goes, I couldn't afford not to. So we're still using those backpacks, and these kids each got a backpack, and they sent this message to my mom. Thank you for the backpack. Hey! So excited, and I love how they clap their hands, so... I just wanted to share that with you. All of this that we do is for this one purpose, is to share the gospel. It's all a tool. Of course, we want them to get better. We want their physical needs met. But ultimately, you know, those ibuprofen, they're going to run out. But having Jesus Christ, that's a lifetime, and that will never fail. And that's, what, that's our goal in going. I think I made this video, my friend made this video for your missions conference several years ago, but just wanted to sh include this. We had the opportunity to go to Nepal for the first time. They said, you have to come before April because it rains. We just had a small team and we understood why um, when we got there. And they said, we, we want you to come after the earthquake in Nepal and come to this body of believers. So I just wanted you to see a little bit of God's provision and how he worked everything out.
who's a Nepali, he said, would you, that would the school, he talked to the principal, said, you have the school children come, these Americans, they want their picture taken with the Himalayan mountains behind them. We can do anything on the road. So we were able to give them the gospel. And of course, we did love looking at, they call them the Himalayas, so the Himalayas behind us. But it was so exciting to be able to share the gospel with them right there. So just a huge field, unreached people group, just seeing the houses dotted all over these mountains with no roads. So our goal is just to continue taking audio Bibles, and TR is um, working to try to get the gospel in those areas. The, we were there that first year. The next year, we saw just such a huge need. My friend Denise, she's an amazing seamstress, and uh, she was able to go back and teach them some sewing for the young ladies that had to miss school for one week every month. We were able to go and help them and just, again, go to the schools and, and share. And it was so neat to be able to go there uh, with the blankets and the boys got hats. And then we, were, we worked with Ahmet. So the next year we went back to his place. He is where the lowest caste is. So he, the road is the riverbed. So you know when rainy season comes, there's nobody going in or out. And they don't, the government doesn't seem to care because they're the lowest of the low in their eyes. The Korean Christians came and built the nicest church in all of Nepal. So it was amazing to be able to be there um, share, whoop, share some the lady made dresses that we were able to take a blind pastor came for our conference and uh, we were able to give him an audio bible his had broken so it was such a joy to be able to give that to him his 11 year old son walked him I think it was three hours every day to come to the conference but so exciting to be able to minister to these people we had a women's conference and while I was doing the women's conference um, T.R. said, would you please come to my parents' house? They had disowned him when he accepted Christ when he was in college as an English major. And somebody, he said, I need an English book. And they said, you know, the best way to read, learn English is a Bible. <laughs> 
And so he accepted Christ when he read in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That is, is an amazing testimony. But he said, can you guys go and share with my parents? The whole neighborhood showed up. And they asked questions like, now we worship many gods. Why do you worship one? And they said, oh, we're glad you asked. And it was an amazing opportunity. And we were supposed to go back there. Uh, we were postponed due to COVID. And then in January, because they thought they kept threatening a quarantine. So Lord willing, we'll be going back there in September. So just exciting to be able to be in Nepal. We went to the Hill Station Church. We really didn't know what that meant. Whoops. But we were able to go uh, minister there to the pastor. Very humble people. TR said, save all your winter clothes for them because they are the most needy. So they put it out there and they made sure everybody had something. And then the um, people were so generous and fed us. And some of these potatoes, they didn't call them potatoes. One tastes like a sweet potato. But one of them they had dug up in the woods the day before for us. And TR said, these are so expensive in the marketplace. So it was just amazing. Just I thought about the widow. <laughs> they, they gave all they had for us. So it was, um, it was great to be there. We want to go back. One of the things we did in COVID, during COVID, was we were able to still help feed these people. So I had a church in Georgia that said, the pastor called me and he said, the Lord's been putting messages on my heart every week, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. And he said, who can we help? I know somebody needs help feeding. So um, I contacted some of the missionaries that I work with and they said, Deidre, our people are starving. And so I loved how they worked in Georgia to feed people in Brazil and Peru. I mean, what a God we serve. And it was amazing. They, um, we would send money. At first, they sent, I did it every quarter. So at first, they um, served the people that were Christians, believers that needed help. The quarantine was very strict there. The men went out every, on odd days, the women on even, and nobody on Sunday. And so it was difficult. So, and then the next quarter they changed it and would use it as a ministering tool. So it was neat. The Brazil, the Daniel family I work with, they also were able to feed people. But my first trip, my last trip was February 2020. My first trip after COVID was February 2021. I went by myself. But the missionaries had said, we want you to come to our dedication service. So this is the new church. It had rained and rained. So they put these um, boards out, and one lady came up. She goes, the red carpet. <laughs> and, um, but this, you may remember, in 2016, we went, and they were bursting at the seams. People were standing on the porch outside. We had to leave the doors open. And the land was so expensive, and we prayer walked that. Um, a hygienist, my friend Jennifer, was with us. She said, I think we need to get a stick and just write scripture in the sand and claim the promises of God. And so that's what we did. And five years later, they have that service. And I was privileged to go, and I just praise the Lord for that. Um, all the people that came out just to celebrate this great building. And it was it was just amazing. So while we were there, okay, I gave, um, I've got a five-minute window. He said 15 to 20, so we're good. So I'm winding it up here. So I got to tell you, this is a great thing, though. So what, during the service, the I don't remember if it was Josh or Melissa said, do you mind FaceTiming? with my parents and just so they want to see this. And I said, I'll be glad to. You all are busy. I'll take pictures. So I was FaceTiming, showing different things. Jennifer that was there, she wanted to see. Because, you know, when you're there 
proclaiming God's promises in the dirt, and then you see this. It's a powerful. I was just a, I was blubbering the whole night, but it was so amazing. So I stay in the back, and I get back there. They're just about to finish, and I look, and you see that man in the yellow shirt with his head down? That's Georgie. And Georgie, in 2009, when I took my very first medical team to Brazil, he came in the door with a piece of paper, and he handed it to the missionary, and he said, here's my light bill. I want you to pay it. You're Americans. You're rich. Pay my light bill. And Josh said, that's not what we do. That's not why they came. We came, and he shared the gospel and told him all how Jesus died for our sins. And uh, he invited him to church on Sunday. Georgie came to church on Sunday, accepted Christ as his Savior, and has been faithful since 2009. So I was thrilled. He has Parkinson's now, so that's why he's seated. Um, but just such a, it was so thrilling. I just praise the Lord that um, I got to see this and see him faithfully serving. So um, we were also able to go out to the farm a ministry. They're working and with no gospel witness out there. They go occasionally and just uh, be able to share. And then we were able to share some food out there. And then I just wanted you to see they don't waste anything. Can you all see that chicken foot? Just so you know, they are very generous and offered it to me first. But I turned it down. I said, no, thanks, but no thanks. And then in Peru, we work with the... A Rahu family. So we were able to go in August and then back in October. Um, this, this was their first outing since COVID. And so it was a huge turnout, just a blessing to be able to do and work with the Peruvian dental team. They're there in Cusco. They have their own chairs that they are able to pack it up and move it. And so it was, again, just exciting to go and be with them. We were in Juliaca, which is a very dark city where they worship the devil. They call him uncle. It's awful. It's a wicked place. And the people wouldn't... This lady said, use my house for a church, the pastor, and it's just a hard, hard place. But a few people would come in, and Ugo was one of them. And he, his blood pressure was high, his sugar was high, and he said, I think it's because I'm angry. And Dr. Carr said, when you get angry, you need to think, how would Jesus handle this? And Doc said, do you know Jesus? And Ugo said, no. But let me tell you, he does now. <laughs> and so the pastor was able to talk to him, and Hugo, Ugo knows Jesus. So it's exciting. That was another place. We're supposed to only have 40% capacity. The police might have come. <laughs> but uh, we did, so he, they didn't do anything, but they did come and tell us to disperse. But it was worth every bit of it for this man on the left to, to accept Christ as his Savior. Seeds were planted in this one. He didn't accept then, but I, we know seeds were planted. And more audio Bibles and upcoming trips. And we just ask that you pray... Iquitos, Peru, the Peruvian dental team is going to meet us there. We are not sure how we're going to get all those chairs and equipment on planes and boats, but we know God has a plan, so be praying for that. And uh, just excited to see what God is doing. And Pastor has given me the name and number, contact number for Jonathan Skeen in Ukraine. I've reached out to him waiting to hear, so... Lord willing, we'll be able to go and help minister with them with medical mission. So just pray about that if you think that. Thank you so much for your faithfulness in supporting me for these 20 plus years. So I appreciate it. I have uh, prayer cards in um, if you want to get those. My number's on the back. Somehow I missed my email address, but it's on the website. You can get it. So, all right. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, 
we are. I mean, they're in the cities. It's much more dangerous there. So we do, it's, anyway, uh, we're live streaming here. So, um, but <laughs> it is, um, no, but it's, it, it's more that not a, to proselyte is the main thing that's the offense there. So we are able to go and work in these communities. And it's a very needy country. Oh, yes, ma'am. We use an interpreter. Yeah, I've been to enough Spanish speaking that I can tell them how to take their medicine, but I am not fluent by any stretch of the, I'm not even, I, I can barely make it. So, anyway, yes, sir. I do, um, we do it many different ways, so people will donate, sometimes we have people that will do like for the VBS, they'll collect it, so we take the Tylenol, Ibuprofen, um, creams, over-the-counter products, vitamins, vitamins are huge there, people love to have vitamins and they just can't get them most places, and then there are other companies that have like MAP and um, Bless. Blessing, blessings, I think, so that you can get prescription medication. So we do it that way. And then if we have to do, so that's how we get the prescription and the over-the-counter, as well as the, like, dollar reading glasses. And a vacation Bible school wanted to do toothbrushes, and their goal was a 1,000. They, it's my dad's church. They delivered them to him, and they just kept coming in, and they said, we have 7,500 toothbrushes. <laughs> so I have lots of toothbrushes. Yes, sir, did you have a question? Because I know that you're, you're a certified pharmacist. Does that give you access that an ability that otherwise you might not have in some of these four countries? I think so, just because of, well... I don't know that this is your question, but when we go there, many of these places have socialized medicine, so they're seeing the doctor is free if they can get in. Their medicine is not, however. So that helps us. I, I don't know that my credentials help us get in, but having that pharmacy and giving them free medicine is huge. And that's one of the things with Nepal. When we were there, they had planned to have the clinic on the outside because they said they wouldn't come in the church. It was pouring down rain a month before it was has ever rained there. And I said, we don't have a choice. We have to have it inside. And they came in. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I got you. <laughs> All right, anything else? All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Deidre, and I know how question and answers go. Um, you're going to think of your question in about 30 seconds here, so just write it on your hand, and uh, you can ask her right after service again. There are prayer cards. Be sure to pick one of those up so that you can pray for her, and uh, certainly uh, pray regarding this potential collaboration in Ukraine here. Uh, you know, there's situations where needs are vital and immediate, and... Um, we just kind of have to be in the right place at the right time with God's timing to see what will happen uh, with these things. And so just want you to uh, consider those things. Um, I'm going to do something right now. I'm going to get a, Mark, I'm going to get a head count here of those who might be uh, going with us uh, after service uh, for, for health food up at Sherry's. And, um, and so anyway, just need a show of hands so that uh, we can get a count ahead for them. And so just kind of looking in there, and I'm going, I'll put them up, put them up high. Yeah, don't, 
don't do the I'm not sure I'm saved type thing, you know, put that hand up high. I'm sure I'm hungry type thing. Okay, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So we'll figure out 11. 11 right now. And probably somebody's going to change your mind because by the time service is over, they're going to go, I'm hungry. So, but anyway, so that's what we have right now. So be sure to get that out. That'll be fine. And uh, Mark is going to lead us in a couple more songs here. So Mark, go ahead. All right. Turn to page number 16. Number 16, Stuart Hamblin. Chimes ring out another news, another day is through. Someone slipped and fell. Was that someone you? You may have longed for added strength, your courage to renew. Do not be disheartened. For I bring hope to you. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open. Just take him at his promise. Don't run away and hide. It is no secret what God can do, what he's done for. Turn to page 109 and stand with me if you would, please. Send the light, amen? And that's the reason we do missions. One of the ways that we send the light, amen? There's a call come ringing o'er the restless waves. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light. Send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call today, send the light, send the light. And the golden offering of the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Forevermore, let us pray. Grace for everywhere about. Send the light, send the light, and Christ like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, 
Send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love, send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels from the crowd above. Send the light, send the light, send the light. A blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. wonderful singing. Please turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Matthew, book of Matthew uh, chapter 13. Uh, as we sing that song, Send the Light, understand um, uh, the Bible College I went to actually had fabulous uh, missions conferences, and it really was at one of those missions conferences that I, I, I surrendered to the Lord, I surrendered to his will, and I, I said, whatever, whatever you want me to do, I'm yours, never dreamt it'd be the pastor, but uh, um, in fact, I, it wasn't until then that I realized, oh, yeah, I guess I had an exception to the rule. Uh, I really, I, there's one point in my life I said, Lord, I'll do anything for you except be a pastor. That's the one exception. And I'd even, uh, I'd even say no to missions. But uh, anyway, it's amazing what God would do. But in that Bible college, they would take the song, uh, send the light and they would change the words to the song because you have to understand okay you're in Bible college um, the ladies are there for their MRS degree and uh, <coughs> some of the men didn't get it they were still there for their bachelor's degree uh, but we still we still enjoyed singing the song send the wife the blessed gospel wife we still would sing it and we put other words to that song as well and so Anyway, Matthew chapter uh, 13, uh, looking at verse uh, 24. Please look along with me. As we look at the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in some ways, this will be maybe more of a teaching message than a preaching message, uh, but dealing with some very, very important observations in the Word of God. Starting in verse 24, uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Another parable he put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now let's move ahead to verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you, uh, being the divine teacher and us repeating uh, the words of Jesus, the divine teacher, uh, sent of you to this earth. I pray that we would learn something tonight about you, about life, about the afterlife, about our responsibility and their limitations. 
about the devil and his schemes in that we could become and desire to be effective ministers for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As we look at scripture here, Jesus would very, very often speak in parables. And, and what a parable is, a parable is a, a symbolic story from our Lord, our Lord that points to a concrete truth. And, uh, and Jesus was, being God, was, uh, was really the world's greatest teacher. And he, and he had a teaching process. And he could take people from the familiar and apply it and bring them into uh, the unfamiliar. And, um, and the interesting thing is that, you know, Jesus desired to do this. He gave some good news for Christ's disciples. And I want you to think about this as we read this. I'm going to go back to Matthew 12, 11. Uh, Matthew uh, chapter 12. Um, actually, Matthew chapter 13, looking at verse 11. Because the disciples asked the question, why these stories? Why are you doing this? And Jesus gave a, a word that should be encouraging to you. And it should be encouraging to me as his disciples. And he answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. I want you to think about this. If you have trusted Christ as your personal Savior, I want you to understand that God has given you a divine privilege. And God wants you to know this. It is given unto you to know the mysteries of heaven. And through the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, and through the power of God, and through having in your hands the word of God, and the power of the illumination of the word of God, you have been given a special privilege that exists between these pages, which is one of the reasons why this book should never be closed and gathering dust on a shelf or on a coffee table because God has given you a privilege that he will not give to anyone else in the world for the lost person that reads the word of God they might as well be reading Swahili uh, they can pick up some truths out of it but it doesn't make sense to them they cannot connect the dots because the natural man discerneth not the things of the Lord you have been given a divine privilege a special privilege to discern the things of God and God has no desire to hide his truth from you and so that's something to think about why would we squander such a great privilege such a great value the God of the universe wants to communicate with you and he wants you to know the truth what a wonderful thing this is God wants you to know his word and then the other thing about God wanting you to know his word the other wonderful thing is God always explains his symbols in his word. And that will help you a great deal when you realize that God has symbols in scripture, but he explains his symbols. Because there are some people who don't even know how the word of God that operates and they try to convince you that everything is a symbol. And then you get into the book of Revelation and they try to convince you that everything is symbolic and that's actually not true. What is symbolic in the book of Revelation? God actually is nice enough to tell you, okay, this is symbolic. Everything else is real, and just because you don't get it doesn't mean it isn't real. Just because you hear about a bottomless pit, the bottomless pit is not symbolic, it is real. The smoke ascending from a furnace out of the earth is it is real. Uh, the creatures that are coming out, they are real. And many times you read it and it says, and they were this and they were this. Sometimes they'll say they were like this, which means they're not exactly that, but there's something similar to that. But God is kind enough to teach you and explain to you. And Jesus in this passage is kind enough to explain to his disciples the meaning of the passage. Oh, wait a minute. If you trusted Christ, you're his disciples too. And what is a disciple anyway? A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ. 
which every single one of you that have trusted Christ as your personal savior, you have that wonderful divine opportunity and privilege. Now, there was a pastor who preached a message years and years ago in Stevensville, Montana, in my first pastorate there, and he came down from Missoula and he preached this message. I love the message. It says, are you a disciple or are you just saved? And I want you to think about that. Some people, they're happy enough, they receive Christ, happy enough to get their salvation patch and to go on their merry way and be miserable the rest of their life. Did you catch that? Be miserable the rest of their life because they refuse to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and we're all called to discipleship. And so uh, I often say there's nobody more miserable in the world, not even a lost person. There's nobody more miserable in the world than a born-again Christian who refuses to live the Christian life. There's not a more miserable person on planet Earth. But all of us have the responsibility, but also the privilege of discipleship and being used of God. And so I want to go into this message, and I want you to think about it in the concept of discipleship, in the concept of in this parable, you being the worker in the field. And for some of you go, I don't know what that is. I just have calluses on my thumbs from my smartphone. Okay, uh, the good news for me is I didn't live on much, but I lived on eight and a half acres and my dad made sure I was a worker in the field. And, and so I learned some things. I learned how to sweat. I learned how to get aches and pains. And uh, I'm glad that I did. But I want to go through this, the explanation of this parable point by point, And I want us to, to learn some things as we go through this. Let's look at verse 36. And it says this, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came unto him saying, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And so the first point, seven points tonight, the first point is this, as Christ's disciple, you ask him to reveal his word. to you. How hard is that? What did the disciples do? They went to Jesus says, we don't get it. Will you tell us what it means? And Jesus said, of course I'll tell you what it means. Now, I don't know why they skipped other the other ones. They skipped over the grain of mustard and they skipped over the leaven and things like that. And, and to this day, theologians are going, disciples, why didn't you ask him to explain that? But um, nevertheless, we have that, that we're dealing with this one. Jesus, they asked Jesus to explain this parable and he explained it to them. And because he did that, he explains it to us. But I want you to understand that as you're reading the word of God, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, as a servant of God, ask God to reveal his word to you. Because it's all there. It's all there in the printed page and it's all the truth is contained. And sometimes we just need it to leap off the page for us. And that's maybe one of the most exciting things uh, in my life <coughs> is reading a passage I've read a hundred times before and something new just leaping off the page. That is what the exciting thing is. So as Christ's disciple, ask him to reveal his word to you with this understanding. If you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, it follow God. God is not trying to hide it from you. That's important to understand. Okay, this gets us to the second point here. Look at verse 37. He answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. And I want to point this out so we understand it's talking about good seed, not bad seed, good seed. So catch this, the gospel of Jesus Christ only is the good seed. And so that's what we need to understand is look, what seed do we need to sow? What we need to sow is the gospel. Uh, you know, uh, we're not out to just sow other things, okay? You know, we're, we're, we're not out just to scotch tape things or just out to bandage things. As, uh, as uh, the missionary told us, and rightly, the ultimate goal, what's the ultimate goal? It's the gospel. The ultimate goal is to sow the good seed. What does Pendleton, Oregon need? Ask any wheat farmer. If they're sowing wheat, winter wheat, they want to know it's good seed. You know, they want to sow good seed. What does Pendleton need? It needs the good seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does the United States of America need? It needs the good seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
What does the U.S. government need? The good seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What do we need around the world? We need the good seed, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And only the gospel of Jesus Christ is good seed. The Apostle Paul gave us that clarification. Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 when he said this. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you let him be accursed there's only one good seed and it says this it says as we said before so say i now again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be accursed there's only one good seed and that one good seed is the, the word of god it is specifically the gospel of jesus christ and so as we go through this parable we have this, we have declaring the parable, and we have he that soweth the good seed is the son of man. It is the message of Jesus Christ. And it's a good thing that there's a message because there's a world that needs to hear it. And this comes out, the field is the world. The field is the world. It's a pretty big field. It's bigger than the eight and a half acres that I ran around on. It's bigger than the 1,000, 1,500, uh, whatever acres is that Brother Glenn uh, runs his tractors on. And Brother Glenn, I really do not understand. It's such a big place. Why do your cows always want to get out? I don't get it. It's just, it's huge. And, uh, but anyway, but it's bigger than that. The field is the world. It is the entire world and there's a world that needs the gospel and that is why jesus says in in the book of mark chapter 16 verse 15 go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and just in case you think the job's done we have this little problem with this word all and this word every as all the world and every creature one of the greatest mistakes that I think believe in the United States of America is there were times where there was a much more aggressive gospel witness in the United States of America. And everybody thought, I think we pretty much have this done now. There's just one little major problem. And that is, parents have babies. And there's another generation. And there is another generation that needs to know the word of God. My wife and I, yesterday, we knocked the door of a man who had a Bible name. His name is Peter. That's a good Bible name. A man with the name Peter who has never been to church his entire life. Not once. Not even one time. And I'll tell you what, if that's indeed the case, we still got a lot of work to do. It is a pretty big field. And we need to know that we're doing our part to sowing in the field and so there's a world that needs the gospel. And then fourthly, let's get to verse 38 here. It says this, The field is the, wor is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. So this brings us to the complication in the process as we go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that is this, the gospel produces converts, competition, and controversy. The gospel produces converts, competition, and controversy. And if you were to go into Acts chapter 8, here's what you would find. For every Ethiopian who is a true convert of Jesus Christ, there is also a Simon the Magician who is a false convert of Jesus Christ. Isn't it amazing that both of those are in the same chapter? You've got the Ethiopian eunuch, most undoubtedly a true convert, and you've got Simon the Magician, most undoubtedly, as we find out later, a false convert, that is, after he supposedly receives Christ, that is, after he is supposedly baptized. That is after he is supposedly a member of a church. And then it's found out that wasn't the thing with him. He just saw Christianity in competition 
in with what he was doing and it was raining on his parade and so he was trying to find out what the, his, their gimmick was so that he could kind of get back to the top of the pack. Wheat. Tares. Wheat and tares. And by us doing everything right. Did you catch that? Everything right. There are wheat and there are tares. And that's important to do. Because there is the God of heaven and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And there's also a person who the scripture calls an enemy. And we will talk about him in just a moment. And I want you to understand, this is something that I understand really, really well. Because I love to garden. And I grow my plants well, but I grow my weeds even better. And you know, now I know I planted the plants. I never planted the weeds. They're just there. And some of those weeds, I don't know if you've noticed this, there are counterfeit weeds in your garden. On the west side where I grew tomatoes, there was another weed that came up and their leaf looked almost like a tomato, but it was not a tomato. And it would even put out these little green things that looked almost like little green cherry tomatoes, but it was not a tomato plant. It was a weed. Wheat and tares. And so you got the real stuff and you got the phony stuff and it comes out, it looks a whole lot the same and sometimes you can't really figure out which is which. You've got wheat and you've got tares, but here's something I know about those weeds and this is what bothered me so much. Just as my plant is sucking food out of the soil, those weeds are sucking food out of the soil at the same time. They're competing. And so it, it's so interesting where there may not be anything going on, but all of a sudden a place the gospel rushes in, all the counterfeits in the competition rushes in at the same time. One of the great, great concerns about our, our missionary in Ukraine is when the war started, every religious group that was a, had any kind of foreign connection, they just raced for the border and they raced out. And he said, now they're coming back. But he said, here's the great concern. It appears the cults are coming back first. The tares are coming back first, not the wheat. And that is why, if you watched his video, he sounded so desperate. And he said, we need to get the gospel back into the country. So understand, the gospel produces converts. The adversary produced look at verse 39 the enemy that sowed them is the devil so now we know who sowed the tares in the first place and I got to I got to say something you're going to go pastor did you really think that up I really did the adversary produces adversity that was deep wasn't it the adversary and that's the term adversary produces adversity in God's kingdom and I want to point out something because sometimes I think we look at first Peter 5 8 a little bit wrong look with me at first Peter 5 8 for a moment the adversary produces adversity but we need to understand the devil's tactics and the devil's activity and I want you to notice this it says be sober be vigilant because your adversary Catch this, your adversary, that means the devil is your adversary and that the devil is my adversary. And one of the things that the devil creates is adversity. But I want you to look at this carefully because I think we get something wrong here. As a roaring lion walketh about seeking disciples whom he may devour. Is that what the Bible says? That is not what the Bible says, but sometimes we get mixed up thinking that is what the Bible says. When the devil is about with a roaring lion, if you're saved, he's not looking for you to devour. He is not looking for me to devour. He is looking 
for others to devour, those who were not saved, those are who the devil is looking to devour. The devil can't devour you. The devil can't devour me, but he is your adversary because I, you need to understand what an adversary does. An adversary, okay, let me, uh, let me point this out. Okay, any of you been in races? Any of you done races in school? Races in school, anyone here? Raise your hand, you've done races in school. Okay, races in school, races in school. You ran cross country, okay? Did you run cross country against anybody? Okay, did you run cross country against anybody from another team? That person was your adversary. Are you getting it? An adversary is somebody who comes alongside you and competes with you to to gain a prize so that you cannot have it. To gain an advantage so you cannot have it. So who is the devil competing with you for? He's competing with you for the souls of men. Those whom you're sowing the good seed. And he creates adversity. He's not looking to devour you. He's looking to devour them. And the scripture says you need to resist him. And that is you need to make sure that he, you need to make sure the devil knows it's a race. You need to make sure the devil knows it's a fight. And let me tell you something. If you rely on the power of God, it is a race. And if you rely on the power of God, it is a fight. But it's important to understand that he's not your devourer. He's your competitor. But as you can see in this parable, he creates trouble in the field. There's wheat and there's tares. And it's difficult because the wheat is the Ethiopian eunuchs of the world and the tares is the Simon the magicians of the world. And sometimes it's really hard to figure out what is what. And sometimes we, we, we get tempted. Every disciple, remember you're only the worker in the field. Every disciple is tempted and asks God, should I start weeding? Meaning, you know what? And then it just starts looking around the church going. Are they wheat or are they tares? Is that a weed? Should I pull that weed? Begins to ask. And this is a very, very interesting thing. And it happens, you know, there was a, a man. I really liked him. I was an assistant pastor. I was in Wenatchee, Washington. And there's a man I knew, and he's a public speaker, and years and years ago, he's actually chaplain. He's actually a chaplain for the Washington State Huskies. Don't hold that against him. He is, um, I think it was even chaplain for the Seattle Seahawks. And, um, but anyway, he would come into the church, and I really love the people in that church. And there are some really sweet people in that church. And he would stand beside me, and he'd say, there are some really, really wonderful people in this church they would say it's too bad that we won't see all of them in heaven why do you say that wheat tares and sometimes you think you know and sometimes you wonder and sometimes you go lord can i start weeding what does the parable say the parable says not to weed. Because look at this. It says the harvest is the end of the world. And the reapers are Christians. No. The angels. The reapers are not. Uh, the ones who get to weed are not you and not me. And if you look back at the parable here. You have his, the servants. That's you and me. Said unto him. That is Christ. Wilt thou then that we should go and gather them up? Can we start weeding? And he says, nay, lest while you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat that is with them, because sometimes the roots of the wheat are tangled in the roots of the tares. What does that mean? That means we're really pretty bad at weeding, but God is actually very, very good at that. And so we look at that. And so we look at that because the tares are tangled in the harvest, it is best to let the angels do the weeding. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? 
something to consider. Doesn't mean you don't pray. I, I pray a lot. But it's best to let the angels do the weeding. Does the angels sometimes weed? They actually do. I want to point out to you a very, very interesting verse. An observation by, by, um, by John, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of God, as he talks about things that happen that he's observed regarding kind of the ebb and flow of discipleship and people and people going. And he says this in verse 19 of 1 John chapter 2. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be manifest that they were not all of us. Now, let me be careful when I say this. Not every person who leaves a church is a tear. 1 John 2.19. Okay. Not every person who leaves a church is a tear. But some are. Just something to think about. And uh, uh, my wife is a pastor's daughter. She got the double whammy. She is a missionary's daughter and then she is a pastor's daughter. And in the church that he pastored over there in western Washington, sometimes somebody would come up and go, Pastor, why did so-and-so leave? And he would quote this verse. <laughs> it says, if they were of us, they would have remained with us. They weren't of us. And so sometimes that is indeed the case. So, where does this bring us? Let us come to the end here. And so it says this, it says, Therefore, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. For the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so here's what I say. How do we pray in a situation like that? We're dealing with all this. And we're dealing with the Ethiopian eunuchs. And we're dealing with the Simon the Magician. And we're dealing with sowing the good seed. And we're dealing with the good fruit coming up. And we're dealing with the weeds that came up with the fruit. What do we do with this? And this is going to sound really, really deep. You pray for God's safe weeding process. Is what you pray. You know, you let God and his angels do what they do best. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to reach people with the gospel. And so sometimes we always have to be careful not to think too much about the tear and weed things. But to think about what we're doing and then let God do what he does best. Um, the important thing for us in this audience is to say, make sure you're wheat and not a tear. Always make sure you know yourself what you are let's have a word of prayer dear heavenly father please use your word in our hearts and help us lord to become very very good servants in your harvest field and become very very good at sowing the good seed and to become very astute and very prayerful as you are not trying to hide your word from us nor your intent and help us to know with wisdom the best things that we can do as disciples of yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand together. The song is 153. All to Jesus I surrender. It is very, very hard not uh, to sing this song with everything that we've heard about missions and the gospel and the mission field this month. And the need has never, never been greater. Let us know that we've given of ourselves and given up ourselves to him so we can know his path, his direction, his will, and his blessing. 
let us sing this song together. Oh, to Jesus I surrender. Sing, oh. 